know to think of the prospect of beginning a list of thank yous for the people that are giving to the Lord here in this place. But take most of most of the sermon time. I'm not sure I want to give that all up. But I am grateful for people here that love God and are willing to show it not just in their words but in their lives. Friday night we had a blessed time of fellowship with the movie and, and we're very grateful for all that Lori does to plan our special events and our outreach activities. Uh, we're, we're grateful for that. I'm grateful for Jackie and Sonny that are leading a women's class right now that has filled the classroom uh, of ladies that are just joining together uh, around the Word of God and doing a good work for Christ. The people that come and serve at the Lord's table are prepared for it. Just uh, the, the list goes on and I, so I am grateful. God is doing the work in your lives. Today we're here right now for one reason. To honor Him because of what He's doing. So this morning we're going to continue our sermon series through the, uh, what we call the Beatitudes. And this topic this morning is, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Now I want to start off by simply saying to you this. Being the blessing for those that mourn has nothing to do with the Buckeyes are losing at halftime. <laughs> And being comforted, comforted has nothing to do when they pick it up and do their job in the second half. No love. But that is not what we're talking about this morning. Although I guess I just kind of threw it in, didn't I? In Matthew chapter 5 and verse 4, it simply says, Blessed are those that mourn, for they shall be comforted. So Israel, the people of God, had left Egypt and marched towards the promised land. And they came to Mount Sinai, and God came down to meet them. I don't remember if I don't know if you remember the event or, or hearing about it, reading about it in the Old Testament. It was quite an event, however. God was preparing to give the commandments, the law. He was setting forth thou, what thou shalt do and what thou shalt not do. So God told Moses to gather the people and have them gather around at the base of the mountain and to keep a good distance because if they came up onto the mountain, they would perish. So the people of God had gathered at the base of the mountain and God called Moses and Joshua to come forth and to come up onto the mountain of the, the ways. And then it's like just these clouds came over the mountain. And thunder and lightning, like you, you know, like one of those storms that's 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 a rare storm, like you hardly ever see it. It was it was awe-inspiring. And out of the darkness and the thunder and the lightning, the voice of God began to speak. And the people were terrified by the presence of God. When God came to give us the law, which shows us where we have fallen short in our walk with Him, it shows us that we are needing of a Savior. It shows us that unless we become poor in spirit and mourn over our sin, that we have no hope. So the law was given. What a very different scenario when we see Jesus caring for, teaching, showing people in person the way to walk with God. And so he comes to this point where he goes up upon the mountain, and instead of fear and trembling and peals of thunder and lightning, he calls his disciples to come up among them. And instead of proclaiming a law that shows us how far away from God we are, he shows us the life to demonstrate how close to God we can get. 
What an awesome thing to be able to be in that situation. And instead of feeling like we're in fear, needing to flee from God, we feel compelled to go up and sit on the, sit on the grass and hear everything the Savior has to say. What a very different message. And yet, that's exactly what, what Jesus was, was doing, was, was showing that how the law led people into a time of fear because it separated them from, from God. It showed us how far away from God we are. But Jesus began with, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for they shall inherit the kingdom of God. And then he said, And blessed are those who mourn, for they <coughs> shall be comforted. A preacher from years ago, Spurgeon, had said, A ladder, if it is to be useful, must have its first step very near to the ground. This gospel message which we proclaim blesses mankind by reaching to the very spot on this earth where the law left us in separation from God. So it is the gospel of Jesus that is the ladder that, that gives us the opportunity to have access to the Savior. So we are looking this morning at being blessed for mourning. But what does it mean to mourn? When we think about mourning and the kinds of things that we're, we're facing, what are the kinds of things that Jesus says blesses us for mourning over? There's three different kinds of ways that we can mourn. And the first way of mourning is sinful mourning. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 10 it says, For the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces repentance with regret, leading to salvation. But the sorrow of the world produces death. So if we sorrow in Christ, it leads us to repentance and having no regret over our sin. But if we sorrow like the world, if we, 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 are, we feel guilt and remorse, but it produces nothing different in our lives, it leads to our death. And so we need to bring people to a point that they understand that sinful sorrow, sinful repentance, sinful mourning, is not going to benefit them in their walk with the Lord. I think a good example of sinful mourning is King, King Ahab of the Israelite nation in the Old Testament. God had given Ahab a palace that was really without comparison. He had given to Ahab a kingdom. But next to the palace, a poor man was living. His name was Naboth. And Naboth had a vineyard. And the king would walk around his palace and enjoy all the splendor and enjoy all the things that God had given to him as the king of Israel. But he kept, as he walked around the palace, especially as he walked around the walls of the outside, he kept looking over and he kept seeing poor little Naboth down there in his little vineyard. And of all the things he had and possessed, you know what he wanted most? He wanted the vineyard of the poor man next door. He wanted something he couldn't have. He wanted something that God had blessed somebody else with. And sometimes when we look at our lives, we look at the fact that God has blessed us in so many ways and given us so many things, but we see the one thing that God has blessed somebody else with, and we say, I want that too. And so we feel like we may be lacking and not having exactly what we, we want or what we think we should have. So coveting is mentally desiring or even claiming as our own what God has given to others and has not given to us. Sinful mourning is a, is a killer. It leads to death, the scriptures say. So obviously, when, God, when Jesus is speaking on the Sermon on the Mount, he's not talking about sinful mourning. Jesus isn't saying that we should have more of that kind of warning, that more of that kind of desire to have what everybody else has. Another kind of mourning is what, is what we would call natural mourning. Natural mourning is that which we have when we grieve the loss of someone we have lost. Natural mourning is the, is the natural response to grief. Those that have ever suffered the bereavement of a loved one understands what I'm saying. 
when I speak of natural mourning, that separation between yourself and the one that you've loved, that you can't, you can't bridge the gap between you and them because death has separated you. I think natural mourning is a teaching element that God has given to us, that we understand that death separates. And as we are separated from those that we love and we feel the mournful loss of those that we really care about, God is teaching us to instruct us of the kind of mournfulness that we should have in our separation from God. That sin separates. And though we experience that in our physical bodies, Jesus has promised a resurrection from the dead if we would but trust in Him. And we are comforted when we mourn the loss of our loved ones in the idea that we will be reunited in the heavenly kingdom. But the grief is real and the sorrow is certain. In the first of the seven Beatitudes, and even really in the eighth, that of being persecuted for righteousness, the outcome of our life is marked by the blessings of God, even, even though we might be persecuted. So nobody would command another person to have more mournfulness in a natural way. Jesus would be um, a, a poor teacher, if you will. He would have been off the mark if he was teaching that you and I should be pursuing greater grief when we lose our loved ones. So again, I say to you that Jesus isn't talking that we should experience more mournfulness over the people that we have lost. He's talking about a different type of mourning. And so what is he speaking of this morning? He's speaking of spiritual mourning. Spiritual mourning. Spiritual mourning is the sorrow that we have over our sins that we have committed against God. The mourning for which Christ has promised that his divine comfort of the Holy Spirit would come into our lives and bring healing to our hearts. In 2 Corinthians 7.10, once again, Paul has said there, we just read it, blessed is the man who mourns in this way because this kind of mourning leads us to repentance and having no regret. So as we understand that Jesus came to show us how to have a right relationship with God, the first thing he said, which we looked at last week, is blessed is though are those who are poor in spirit. Blessed are those who know that they have no hope except through Jesus Christ. And then to understand that the fact that we, our hope is in Jesus Christ, we can't have a right relationship with Him because our sin is keeping us from being close to Him. We've got to deal with the sin in our lives. Sin separates us from God. So we have to be mournful of the lives that we have lived, of the sins that we have committed in order to have a right relationship with our Father in Heaven. I believe that the subject that we're looking at this morning is of major importance to the church today. I don't mean just our church. I mean God's people around the world need to hear this message. Those that are flocking to congregations around the, around the world this morning need to hear about what spiritual mourning is and what it means to grieve over their sins. I believe that today true Christians are surrounded by a form, an image of faith that has become so emaciated and so diluted that it's almost unrecognizable as a faith in Jesus Christ anymore. That we merely make a mental acknowledgement and we call that faith. That we call upon the love of God so that we can feel better about the life we live without changing them. Faith for many Christians today and for many, many churches today, unfortunately, is being taught as an experience that is very different than the life that Jesus Christ spoke to us about. So I want us to look a little bit about some of the truths of the Scripture. I want us to look this morning at the truths that Jesus Christ shared with us that are key elements of a right relationship with an Almighty Father in Heaven. And the first of those key truths 
is a genuine faith. According to Romans chapter 5 and verse 1, it says that we have been justified by faith. We have a peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. The question is, why does faith justify us? Does the fact that I believe that God exists and that Jesus walked the earth, in fact, even if I should believe that Jesus died on the cross and rose again, does the mere mental acknowledgement of those historical events mean I have faith? Does the idea that I believe that Jesus walked the earth automatically justify me and give me a place in his eternal kingdom? The scriptures say that even the devil and his demons believe, and they shudder in fear, and yet they have not salvation. So what is genuine faith? What is a faith that actually brings about justification. What is a faith that actually brings about a change it, that transforms me from being outside of Jesus Christ to inside of Jesus Christ? If you think about a ladder, the first rung on the ladder would be, if you will, the, the concept, the idea of faith. It's the starting point. It's the idea where we become poor in spirit. When we, are, when we have a faith in God, we're acknowledging, yes, there is a true and living God, and I am separated from Him. I have no hope in Him until I acknowledge that I, that I need to come before Him and accept whatever it is He's giving. And that is that He's giving me His Son. He's giving me redemption through the blood of Jesus Christ. Faith expresses our inadequacy and our absolute need for Jesus Christ. Faith unites us to Jesus, who does in fact justify us, sanctify us, and glorify us through the power of His blood. This power of life, the scriptures say, is given to us when we have the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit living within us. There is not a scripture that I can find or suggest to you that says merely by having belief in God, you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. In fact, I'm going to say to you, even with genuine faith, if it's not followed up with the other things that faith would require of you, you're not going to have that, that gift of the Spirit. Faith is the first rung on the ladder. Today, the world is trivializing Christianity. They're calling it a crutch. They're calling it many things. Faith in Jesus Christ today has been reduced to simply intellectualism, head knowledge. That we should say, oh yeah, there's a God, but we don't change our lives because of it. We don't live differently. Let me ask you a question this morning. Please don't answer it out loud. Do you believe, do you have faith that there is a true and living God. To say yes or to nod our head in the affirmative is a good start. But what proves that we believe it is the change in our life and having met it. God changes lives. When people believe in Him, they, 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 they make a difference in their life. If all of a sudden this morning we started to sm smell the smell of something really hot in this building, and it kind of smelled like something might be smoldering something in, somewhere in the building, some of you might begin to think, the building's on fire. But that's okay. The sermon's really good this morning. I'm just going to sit here and listen. 
Now, as smoke started to rise up from the air conditioning vents, you might have a little bit of additional proof, and you might think even more so. I do believe that the building is on fire. <laughs> but if we don't get up and get out of the building, we really don't believe it, do we? Faith is an action of our lives based on our belief. Faith is much more than an intellectual exercise. It's not something trivial. It is something that is active and genuine and real. And if you really believe in God, it will not leave you the same person as you once were. And yet the faith that is being proclaimed to the world today is, you can believe in Jesus and God will believe will take you just as you are, and he'll leave you just as you are. What a hopeless faith. I, for one, don't want to be left the way I was. I want to be changed and transformed. I want to be made to be a different kind of man than what I used to be. Because I was a man that was once nothing but held in sin and shame. I was a man that once was held in the captivity of death. But now I've been set free by the grace of God. I want to walk in that freedom. I want to walk in that power. I don't want to live in some kind of miserable life where I have to continue being the same person I used to be. I am thankful for a God that is powerful and has overcome this world and says that in Him, through the Holy Spirit living in me, I too can be an overcomer. And so can you. Jesus changes us. We must go beyond simply believing and realize that it's not just a mental game. Faith is real. Faith is the bond that we have living in union with our Savior, Jesus Christ. The attempt for our world today to replace genuine faith with the mere acknowledgement of who God is is leading thousands upon thousands of people today to accept Jesus Christ and make no difference in their life. They don't welcome Him to live in Him. They don't welcome Him to change them. They simply accept Him so they get fire insurance. You cannot say that you have accepted the Savior's gospel message without accepting His Lordship in your life. There's no person in Scripture that you will look at in the, gospel message, in the Gospels that are given to us whereby someone came and met Jesus and whose life didn't dramatically change. Except for those who rejected him. Remember the rich man? What must I do to be saved? Obey the law. That I've done. Sell everything you have and give it all to the poor. What did the rich man do at that moment? He walked away. He couldn't accept that part of the Lordship of Jesus. But every single person that came into the presence of Jesus Christ and believed that he was truly the Son of God, believed that he had the power and the authority over sickness and death and Satan and everything else, their lives <coughs> changed. Look inside yourself this morning and say, has my life changed? Because if there's not a real change, if there's no transformation, perhaps we've not really come yet to the point of being poor in spirit. Perhaps we've not yet come to the point of being mournful over the sins that we have committed. The second thing is true repentance. True repentance. Repentance involves the change of direction. But today it has been reduced to merely admitting I'm a sinner and saying a sinner's prayer. There's not one of us in this room, even though many of us have already accepted Jesus Christ, that couldn't raise a hand and say, yes, I'm a sinner too. The fact that we admit that we are sinners does not demonstrate that we are remorseful over the sins that we committed. It doesn't simply suggest that I've, I've acknowledged that it is my sin that put Jesus Christ on the cross. It's my sin that caused His blood to flow from His side. It's my sin that caused the Father to let go of the Son and to be separated by death. 
It's my sin that caused Jesus to go to the depths of hell to fight for me. Thank God he was strong enough to overcome. If you read and listen to scripture, you'll find a very different story in the scriptures from what the world says today about sin. Seek the Lord while he may be found, the scriptures say. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. That's from the Old Testament. That's Isaiah chapter 55 verses 6 and 7. What is he asking of us? He's asking us to seek God. He's asking us to call upon him so that we can be share with him that we are truly mournful, truly sorry for the sins that we have committed. And he'll have compassion. God says to the wicked, forsake your ways, stop doing what you're doing, and turn. That's a million miles away from what the sinners hearing today, whereby they believe they can continue on their sin. They can live any life they want to live, and God will bless them anyway. That is not truth from the Word of God. In 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 19, it says, The Lord knows those who are His. Let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. Let me say that again, because we are the people of the Lord, are we not? Let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. God is calling us today to turn our lives to Him. So if we're going to call on the name of the Lord, if we're going to say that Jesus truly is our Savior, that I'm a believer, that I'm a Christian, that I'm a follower, however you want to designate yourself as one of the people of God, God is saying to you, depart from your iniquity. Live differently. Union with Christ causes this, the Christian to be humble in their sin and leads us to live holy lives. True repentance. Turning away from the sin we've committed. On the day of Pentecost, we love to talk about Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Just prior to that, the message, the gospel message was preached for the very first time and there was a call for people to, to respond. Their response was, to be cut to the heart. And they actually said, we are guilty of calling for the condemnation of our Savior. We are guilty for telling the, Ro the Roman officials to put Him on the cross. We are guilty of the death of Jesus. How could there possibly be hope for us? We're the ones who put Him on the cross. They really thought, as good as the message was, that they weren't qualified. As good as the message is, we sometimes think we're not qualified. We need to be cut to the heart. We need to be cut to the point that we realize our sin matters to God. Enough that it produces within us a change. Third, thirdly, the washing of regeneration. Jesus saved us on the basis of, not on the basis rather, of our deeds. He did not save us because of what we are, have accomplished or what we will accomplish. But he has, he has done so according to his mercy, according to his own righteousness. In Titus chapter 3 and verse 5, it says that very thing to us. Listen to what it says. He, Jesus, saved us, not on the basis of the deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit. In this one verse, it tells us that we have been redeemed, not on the basis of our, what works we have done, but on the washing of regeneration, by being regenerated. I've talked about baptism being like a point of resuscitation. You know, where, where the defibrillator is 
you know, stand clear. We're going to put the defibrillator on, and Jesus is going to resuscitate your spirit. You're going to be coming back to life in Jesus Christ. The waters of regeneration. And what happens? What makes that so unique? What makes that so miraculous? It is because in that moment, in the only place in Scripture that says that we should ever receive the Holy Spirit is in the waters of Christian baptism. And we are given the baptism of into Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, and he received that gift of the Holy Spirit. Despite the fact that Jesus has commanded us to be baptized, and despite the fact that the scriptures say all of the following about baptism, there are many who will deny its importance and its power and its ability to bring about change in people's lives. Listen to the things the scriptures say occur in the life of somebody who is being immersed into Jesus Christ. It says, we have the forgiveness of our sins. The Bible says in baptism we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. It says that we are clothed with Christ, that we participate in His death, burial, and resurrection. It says that we have died with Christ, and we will therefore live with Him. It says we are circumcised by Christ, a circumcision of the heart. It says that, we, that in baptism we are saved and we are pledging to God a clear conscience before God. I suggest those aren't things that you want to ignore. There isn't one of those benefits in baptism I wish to do without. But many simply say, we don't believe it that way, so here's what we'd like you to do. We'd like you to pray this prayer with us. I talked a moment about the sinner's prayer. Nowhere in the scriptures, Old or New Testament, is there any indication of any kind of a sinner's prayer. Nowhere is there the promise that we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit through prayer. Our relationship with Christ, it, 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 it's not mechanical. It's not just something that is spiritless. It's not, a, it's not a transaction. It's not like doing business with God. And that you're, you're, you're setting up an agreement or a contract. A.W. Tozer, a preacher from the 1800s, wrote, The whole transaction of religious conversion has been made mechanical and spiritless. Faith may now be exercised without a jarring of the moral life, and without embarrassment to our flesh. Christ may be, quote, received without creating any special love for him. A man is saved, but he has no hungering or thirsting after righteousness. And what Tozer is trying to say is, if it's just a business transaction, if you're just saying, all right, I agree with you, you're, you're, you're there, now give me salvation. If it's, if it's just mechanical, if it's just an action that we're doing because it's a business transaction, we're missing the point. God is asking for a relationship with us. God is asking for something to be very real, and very dramatic, and very uh, intimate with us. <coughs> Today we have thousands of people that are willing to admit that they are sinners. They will say that they have accepted Christ, and many of them have never experienced a single moment of spiritual life, a closeness with God, a walking with God, or having experienced His forgiveness. You might say, well, David, that's pretty judgmental. How, how can you dare make that kind of judgment on, on, on this world? Well, I think the evidence is clear. Let me share they haven't ex exhibited or experienced being poor in spirit, acknowledging that they're hopeless without Him. They don't know what it means to mourn over their sin. They are not characterized by a deep hungering and thirsting after righteousness. We're not seeing a movement towards mercy or being pure in heart and pure in life. The life doesn't compare to the, to the words. In worship, we are to gather 
and have a joy over the blessing of what we've discovered through Jesus Christ. I believe the message of spiritual mourning is critical for our world today. So very quickly as we come to a close, distinguishing marks of those that spiritually mourn. Number one, the first mark of, of spiritual mourning is humility. Spiritual mourning follows that falls through of being poor in spirit. It's, it's being humble before God. It's bowing down and admitting that yes, not, not just that I have sinned, but I know that it's my sins, Father, that put your son on the cross. It's being sorry enough about our sins that we're willing to change the way we live. That we're going to fight against sinning. We're going to do everything we can to live in the power of Jesus Christ so we stop sinning. Now I want to assure you, I don't, I don't think that there's ever going to be a day where I'm going to go the rest of my life without ever committing another sin. Jesus says, in his word, that we are to be confident of this, that he who began a good work in us will complete it on the current day of Christ Jesus. But I am telling you what, the Holy Spirit is not impotent. The Holy Spirit is not God without power. He is fully God. He fully lives within you. And that power of God living within you can give you more victory. Otherwise, the Word of God would not say that with every temptation, God has provided a way of escape. Why didn't you take it? We can do better. We need to humble ourselves before God. We step onto the first rung of the ladder, if you will, when we are poor in spirit, when we are humble. You can't get onto the second rung. You can't take the next step until you humble yourself before the Lord. You can't suddenly start mourning over the things that you used to enjoy. Yes, I said that we used to enjoy sin. Sin was fun. Sin made us happy in many ways for a moment. And then it left us empty. And then we realized it left us dead in the sight of God. You can't suddenly start to feel mournful sorrow over something that you in the past have enjoyed without having a humble heart. So we've got to start on that first rung. Nobody would ever sin if it were if, if it was true that we could just suddenly take that leap. Let me ask you, how can you and I learn to hate what we used to love? It's a matter of the heart. The Bible tells us the story of Saul, King Saul. He was a high achiever, but he had a twisted heart. He was the first king of the, of the, of the nation of Israel. He led his army into battle. He took a great deal of plunder for himself and for his men. He cheated and he stole and he took things for himself. He was told that he was to prepare a sacrifice and he was to wait for Samuel to come and prepare the sacrifice. When Samuel arrives, he says, Why do I hear the bleeding of sheep? You're supposed to destroy everything and not take anything for yourself. Why is the bleeding of sheep? Well, I just thought on my own, without your permission or without God suggesting it, that I would take the sheep for myself and then give some of it to God as an offering. Doesn't that sound like a good plan? Samuel says, No, it's not the plan of God at all. So Saul's attitude is, it's not really repentant. He says, well, in any case, would you please bless me just the same? Would you pray over me that God would give me a blessing? Is that not the cry of the world today? I want to continue with my sin. Will you please pray for me that I can go to heaven anyway? You want to know what? There's no prayer of any preacher in this world that has ever lived that's good enough to get somebody else into the kingdom of God. It's a matter of our own heart, folks. Are you willing to be sorrowful over what we've done so that we can live better? It's infused with hope. 
You know, when Judas sinned and betrayed Jesus, If he would have changed his life, if he would have turned, if he would have been truly sorrow, sorrowful, Jesus would have forgiven that betrayal. He forgave Peter's betrayal. But Judas, instead of being sorrowful in the righteous sense, was sorrowful from a worldly sense. And he went out and he took his own life. And he lost hope. Satan, when he deals with your despair, See, here's, what, here's the difference with God and Satan. When you feel bad about sin, Satan wants you to feel like you're no, you're no good and have no value and you'll never get to heaven. He wants you to have despair. When Jesus deals with you in your sin, he wants you to feel sorrowful for your sin and then he gives you hope of eternal life. So if you want to know the difference of who's talking to you, if it's about despair and loss and, 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 and hopelessness, Satan's in the, behind God's bed. If you want to hear from, from, know that it's God speaking to you, He's going to be talking to you about His forgiveness, about your need for repentance, and about living your life for Him, and about the hope you have in eternal life because Jesus Christ has made the way for you. A true Christian will say, O oh, wretched man am I. But a Christian man doesn't stop with saying, What a wretched man am I. He goes on and he says, Thanks be to God who has given me the victory through Jesus Christ. A true Christian will say with Paul, I am the chief of sinners. But he goes on to say, by the grace of God, I am what I am. There are two sides to the coin of, of genuine Christian faith and experience. That which God wants you to know, that which Satan wants. I'm going to simply close with this, and that is to say that if you mourn like this, if you really turn to God and say, I'm sorry that I, I have ever sinned. If you are here this morning and you've never done that, I want to give you the opportunity to come as we sing in just a moment and to say, first of all, I humble myself before God. I can't get to heaven on my own. I am sorry for my sin. I need to be baptized into Jesus Christ. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you've been baptized into Him, but you've never gone really to that point of being sorrowful over your sin, to the point it brought about a change, today's the day for you. To go before the Father and say, Father, I have sinned. And I am not going to let sin hold me in despair any longer. I want what you promised. I want the victory. I want the overcoming. I want to experience the Holy Spirit that you've given me to give me power and victory over my life. And as we live these changed lives, people are going to begin, begin to start asking, what's wrong with those people at the Caledonia Church of Christ? They're really turning weird all of a sudden. And I'm going to rejoice and praise God when people do because they're going to be seeing a Jesus making a difference in our lives that has the hope of changing theirs. <laughs> God has promised that we would be comforted. You know, you know what Jesus was called? He's called the man of sorrows. What does it mean that Jesus was the man of sorrows? It means he understood our condition. It means he understood what it means to, that we were imprisoned by sin. Jesus came to comfort those who mourn. That was his mission. The Bible says that he bore our sins and he carried our sorrows. That's who Jesus is. And then it closes out and it simply says, when he left this earth, he gave us a comforter. Because the, the disciples were like going crazy. What do you mean you're going to die? What do you mean, what, what do you mean you're leaving us? What are we going to do without you? How can we continue on without you? And Jesus said that as I go and leave, I will send a comforter. I will send the Holy Spirit who will guide you into all truth, who will protect you, who will comfort you, who will heal your wounds. We have the comfort of the Holy Spirit. In John chapter 14, it says this. I will ask the Father, Jesus said, and he will give you another helper who is called the Comforter, that he may be with you forever. That is the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him, nor does it know him. But you know him because he abides with you. And what Jesus was saying is, you know the Holy Spirit because it's me. I've been living with you. I've been abiding with you. 
These things I have spoken to you while I have been with you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said. And then Jesus said this to you, his church. Peace. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives, but as my Father gives. Do not let your heart be troubled. Do not be afraid. Man, what a God we have. What an awesome, beautiful, amazing Savior to change our lives. We're going to sing again in just a moment. Leave at 620. If you need to make a decision as a believer to go before the Father and mourn over the sins that you've committed like you've never done before, to start a new walk with Him, a closer walk, a walk, a walk that is more targeted toward overcoming and victory instead of sinfulness and despair, I pray that you make that decision where you are or you can come and share with the congregation. We'll pray with you. If you're outside of Jesus this morning, and you just simply need to humble yourself and say, I need the Lord. I can't do this on my own. I need hope. We're prepared this morning to help you enter into a newness of life. Let's stand as we sing.